You may not know this, but the people in Iran have been rising up there for six weeks. And this regime is brutalizing the people, brutalizing them. And the parliament there, which is basically a bunch of uh, cockroaches who are appointed or selected by the chief cockroach there, uh, Khomeini, uh, they've said that they need the death sentence for 15,000 protesters. But protesters are disappearing. Some of the women who have been reluctantly released somehow from their prisons have talked about torture and rape. Some uh, religious regime, huh? Uh, but this is exactly what's going on as they're racing towards getting nuclear warheads. And I'm sure if you've watched me on Fox with Netanyahu, he's made it abundantly clear that this is actually happening with very little pushback from the U.S. administration. So the niece of the Iranian leader spoke out the other day. She spoke out the other day in what is one of the most courageous and heroic acts you will ever see. Because she knew when she spoke that her uncle, Khomeini, the chief Islamo-Nazi, would come down on her head like a ton of bricks because he certainly can't have a family member break from the, break from the clan, which is exactly what she did. And after she did speak and put out the video, she was arrested and has since disappeared. Go. To some news out of Iran now, the niece of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei has been arrested after she publicly called for foreign governments to cut ties with Tehran over their violent crackdown on the protesters. Hundreds of people have been killed and thousands have been arrested in the unrest which erupted more than two months ago after the death of 22-year-old Mahza Amini who died at the hands of the so-called morality police. Farida Murad Khani is an engineer and a well-known rights activist in Iran. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. How long do we have to witness oppression by political autocrats in any part of this world? Isn't the experience of Hitler, Mussolini, Ceausescu, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, Khamenei, and to this last one, Khamenei, enough to make the world think of a new way? Well, earlier, I spoke to our very own Pia Steckelbach on all of this. Take a listen. Well, Hamda, she's definitely a very interesting figure. You have to imagine she's the niece of Ayatollah Khamenei, and she's also a social activist. So how does that to get, go together? It comes for sure um, with harsh circumstances. You're right, she has been imprisoned before. That was January this year. Back then, she has been transferred to the Evin prison. Hamda, if you remember, Evin prison is that notorious one where a fire broke out about one and a half months ago. And many of those arrested amid the protests are also uh, in there. Now, now, the reason back then why she was arrested in January was also a video where she was praising, praising the widow of the last Shah of uh, Iran and her achievements. Um, you know, before the Islamic Republic was established in 1979, Iran was a monarchy ruled by the Shah. But, you know, positive commemoration of that period is very much uh, suppressed in Iran today. And the mother of Farideh Murad Khani is Khamenei's sister, but already in the 80s, she, in the middle of uh, the war, uh, by the way, between Iran and Iraq, she fled to Iraq, uh, joining her husband. Her husband is a cleric, Sheikh Ali Tehrani, who, by the way, also is a regime critic, um, who also spent 10 years in Iranian prison. Her uh, Faride Murad Khani... So her slow down a second here. So he puts his brother-in-law in prison for 10 years. His sister escapes to Iraq. His niece remains in Iran as a uh, rights activist, human rights activist, and a critic. She's been in prison before, and now she's imprisoned again. Go ahead. Is long known, actually, for her activism, mostly against the death penalty in Iran, but also as an activist for an advocate for civil freedoms. Now, after yesterday's video came out that went viral very, very quickly, she was arrested again. That is according to what her brother tweeted. He said that she was arrested while at a persecutor's office in response to a court order. Now, her, her video is pretty clear. I mean, we've just heard it. She calls for regimes to cut ties with Iran amid the protests um, she, uh, and the human rights violations. She's calling the Iranian regime child murders. This is probably the most outspoken she has ever been, supporting the protests, although herself still wearing the hijab. But, of course, her, her words are very, very attacking to 
towards the Iranian regime. And Hamda, we don't really know when that video is exactly from, if it was indeed recorded yesterday. We also don't really know anything about her whereabouts now or what might happen to her now. But it is very interesting because Farideh Muradkhani has been able to criticize the regime in some sort, of course facing some repressions. But as she's also part of the family of the Supreme Leader, she presumably enjoyed some form of protection, uh, for example, from longer imprisonments or for even worse consequences. But now that attention is on Iran like it was uh, no at no time before, we cannot be sure what ramifications she is going to face uh, right now, this time. Uh, we also cannot expect to receive a lot of information about her. We should um, follow uh, up on her brother who might receive more information on her. So it was reported just a couple of weeks ago by the BBC, and we're not getting a lot of reports in American media on this. This is what drives me crazy. Um, uh, I guess if it doesn't happen at Mar-a-Lago, we don't really learn much about it. Um, thousands of people charged in Tehran over the protests. Go. The Iranian authorities say that 1,000 people have been charged in Tehran over the anti-government protests that have lasted for more than six weeks now. The semi-official Tasnim news agency says the trials will be held in public. So let's bring you more with Paham Kalbadi, who is from our Persian service. Very good to have you with us. Now, the Tasnim news agency is, speaks for the Revolutionary Guard. So what does this mean about trials being held in public? What can we expect? So the trials, they say, they claim that the trial is being held in public. However, I was just on the phone with one of the parents, uh, mother of one of the detainees, and she was telling me, despite that, two days ago they held another trial as well. And she said that before the trial started, so the family members and the two lawyers uh, went to take part in the trial and they were barred from entering the courtroom. And she says that, so what kind of public is this trial that you're saying that neither the family members nor the two appointed lawyers were allowed in and they showed them a piece of paper saying that these two lawyers were just dropped from the case and we appointed other lawyers uh, for the detainee. So this is all, you know, there's so much lack of transparency on what's going on in this, uh, you know, in these trials. This is on the one hand. On the other hand, we see that uh, IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard, is saying that, you know, is giving ultimatum to the protesters, right? That this is the final day, you're not allowed to come out anymore. That was on Saturday, right? That was on Saturday. But every single day we see, including today, that we see that the students are taking part in the protest all across the country, in every single university we've, we've uh, receiving pictures. And uh, it's horrifying images because we see this besiege, this notorious militia entering universities and opening fire on students. We obtained the videos that shows they are shooting at protesters, at students, at university students inside the university. I mean, it's really difficult for you to be looking at all of this footage and having to verify it for us. How are you getting hold of it? So uh, parts of it is just, they just surface on social media. There are different accounts that receive these footages. They distribute it. We get it from them at some time. And our social media team verifies each and every one of them. And we also receive so many footages. BBC Persian receives so many footages ourselves. Uh, there's a new trend in Iran, which is a bit funny that uh, uh, Iranian youth, this, because this is called the Generation Z movement. So Iranian youth nowadays uh, are walking on the streets and they're hitting off uh, turbans of Iranian clerics on the street. This is really a controversial move, but this is a Generation Z movement. And this generation, although they've been living under a theocratic regime for four decades, we see that they are not abiding by in any shape or form. And that's why IRGC Revolutionary Guards warning is not coming to no avail. And Paham, are there still problems with the internet or is everyone able to get online and access social media? So uh, the problem with the internet, uh, uh, like, you know, it, it's different from region to region. For example, when there is a mourning ceremony, for example, for Masa Amini in Kurdistan, the internet connection drops and there's no connection. The other day, I was here a few days ago talking about Zahedan in northeastern Iran, where there were like shootings there. So internet connection suddenly uh, was disconnected and there was no Wi-Fi, no internet connection. So it differs. They That's connected, disconnected. They connected, disconnected. Mm -hmm. And then finally, none of this has stopped the Iranian regime from trying to get its nukes. None of it. Let's check this out. W-I-O-N. Go.
As Iran faces criticism from the International Atomic Energy Agency over Tehran's lack of cooperation with the nuclear watchdog, a new report by Iran's ISNA news agency says the country has begun producing uranium enriched to 60% at its Fordo plant. The plant was reopened in 2019 amid the breakdown of a nuclear agreement with major powers following Donald Trump's unilateral decision to withdraw the United States from it. An atomic bomb requires uranium enriched to 90 percent. Experts suggest 60 percent is a step towards weapons grade enrichment. Iran has always denied any ambitions to develop an atomic bomb, insisting its nuclear activities are for peaceful civilian purposes only. Under the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, Tehran agreed to mothball the Fordo plant and limit in its enrichment of uranium to 3.67 percent, which is sufficient for most civilian uses. In return, the major powers agreed to relax sanctions they had imposed over Iran's nuclear ambitions. But the deal began falling apart in 2018, when then-President Trump pulled out and reimposed crippling economic sanctions on Iran. The following year, Tehran also began stepping away from its commitments yeah, under well, the... Well, let me put it this way. Iran was on the ropes, certainly near the end of the Trump administration, economically on the ropes. And uh, he had his foot, did President Trump, on the throat of this regime, which was collapsing from within. It simply didn't have the economic uh, prosperity that is needed for a country like that. And it was very effective. And I believe that regime would have collapsed, certainly with the rising protests and so forth. But Biden comes in immediately and reverses course. He did the same exact thing when it came to uh, uh, Israel and these, these peace agreements that were being made. He's done exactly the same thing on the border. In other words, he views his success, does Biden, not on whether in fact something is, uh, as an empirical matter, successful but how much of the Trump agenda he can reverse. He and his radicals. Go ahead. It reopened the Fordo plant and started enriching uranium to higher levels. President Biden, of course, wants to revive the agreement and return Washington to compliance with it. Now, this is a regime that will not let the UN now go anywhere. This is a regime where they have now found uh, hard scientific evidence of their progress in towards nuclear weapons in areas where they're not supposed to be working on it. This is a regime that has put assassination hits out on American uh, officials, including former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Uh, this is a regime that is helping to arm up the Russians to slaughter the Ukrainians with drones. This is a regime now working with China, Russia, and North Korea. So, I, I mean, I can go on and on and on about this regime. You see these programs on TV of men and women who have fought in Iraq, that part of the world, or Afghanistan, and, and you see many of these people who come out of Iraq. You see the casualties, missing limbs, limbs uh, head uh, damage, and so forth and so on. That's the Iranian regime, for the most part, that, that did that to our men. Want to see more Mark Levin? Go to levintv.com and subscribe now.